Lord, now as we turn to this, your holy word, we pray that you would open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things in it, that you would transform our lives by the working of the Holy Spirit, that you would make us fit for the work of the kingdom. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Kaheleth, the preacher and sage of Ecclesiastes, said, what has been is what will be. What has been done is what will be done, for there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new. It has already been done in ages before us, though there is hardly a remembrance of those things. Indeed, there is nothing new under the sun. The new pagan presuppositions, for instance, of scientific modernity are philosophically indistinguishable from the old pagan presuppositions and superstitions of mythic antiquity. The doubt of the present looks eerily like the doubt of the past. The old Babylonian, Egyptian, and Greek creation myths, for instance, depicted man as a sort of accident of random or capricious impersonal forces, just another incidental happenstance in the long chain of being. According to those ancient legends, Man is therefore little differentiated from any other material creation, animate or inanimate. Sound familiar? Regardless of the source, Sennacherib's astrologers, Belshazzar's priests, Amenhotep's magicians, Hesiod's theogonists, or Darwin's biotheorists, the philosophical commitment remains the same. Man can enjoy no special place in this world because there's nothing special, not about man and not about the world. The myth makers of long ago and the myth makers of the present day share common ontological and epistemological assumptions, equally complex and equally larded with specious but gravely sacrosanct jargon. The metaphysical robes of the ancients have been traded for the lab coats of the moderns, capricious gods for random amino acids, but the argument is essentially the same and the inhuman humanism that results is essentially the same. But the Genesis account of creation, and particularly the account of the sixth day, provides us with a startling contrast and corrective. Here, man is no accident. He is not a mere extension of what has has come before a series of processes, but rather he is the pinnacle, the crowning glory of a personal, intimate, ordered creation. Astonishingly, right at the beginning of God's autobiography, we have embedded the biography of man. And in telling us man's story, God reveals much to us about himself, about his pre-existent sufficiency and the glory of his triune covenant relationship from eternity past, from before all time. Now, at first, when, when you come to the narrative of the sixth day of creation, it appears to be very much like all of the previous five days. 
Notice the familiar language that is here. And God said, verse 24, let the earth bring forth creatures according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made, verse 25, God saw, and it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, verse 31, the sixth day. Very familiar language up to this point, but, but notice in verse 26, the familiar begins to fall away. Suddenly the narrative grows longer, more detailed, more intimate, and the language is, is altogether new. When the narrative turns from beasts to men, there's a startling interruption in the creation pattern. Clearly, something special, something new, uh, uh, something glorious is happening here. It's not just the continuation of a series of processes. And this is no accident. Uh, look at verse 26. Let us, God says, Make man in our image, after our likeness. The use of the first person, a plural pronoun here is, is striking. Now, some commentators have uh, said that this is uh, easily explained in terms of the abstract notions of majesty, the, the royal we. Or as R.C. says in his little booklet on the, on the Trinity, what is the Trinity? This is the editorial we, perhaps. Or perhaps other commentators have said this is the, the language of deliberation. Or, or perhaps this is a, a, a plural intensive. But we can't help but assume that that. Also here, we find the first glimmerings of the Trinitarian revelation. Already, the Creator God has revealed Himself as Elohim, a plural noun paired with singular verbs, a, a, a seed perhaps of the notion that God in eternity past dwelt in community. One God, three persons, now, right at the very beginning of creation, this Elohim sends his spirit out over the unformed void. R.C., in, uh, in his little booklet, says, even though we cannot find an explicit definition of Trinity in the Old Testament, we do find scattered hints there about God's triune nature. Here in verse 26, we have what may well be far more than just a hint. Herman Bavink, in his uh, magisterial reformed dogmatics, uh, says, the seeds that developed into the full flower of New Testament Trinitarian revelation are already planted in the Old Testament. Elohim, the living God, preexistent, self-sufficient, from before all time, creates by speaking His Word and sending His Spirit. The world comes into being by a threefold cause, he says. First, in the Word of God, we see this in Genesis 1 and Psalm 33 and Psalm 147, and Joel 2. But second, he says, we see this threefold cause in the Word hypostatized as wisdom. Job 28 and most magnificently in Proverbs chapter 8 and Job 26 and Jeremiah 10. 
But third, he says, that we see this threefold cause in the Spirit of God. Genesis 1, 2, and in Psalm 33, and Psalm 104, Job 26, and Isaiah 40. Above it goes on and he says, whereas God calls all things into being by his word as a mediating agent, it is through his spirit that he is eminent in the creation and vivifies and beautifies it all. A threefold divine principle underlies creation as well as recreation and sustains the entire economy of the Old Testament revelation. Yahweh, the covenant God, reveals himself to and then later saves and preserves his people by his word and his spirit before all time that God set this into motion. And it is embodied in his person. Here in Genesis chapter 1, we see not only this declaration in plural pronouns, but notice too the special deliberative, consultative language. Let us, God says, Some translators have suggested that this might well be rendered, shall we? Here, uh, God reveals much about himself, the the equality of the three persons of the Trinity, the the, the divine harmony, uh, the glory and the majesty of this pre-existent one in three, three in one. Here, we see God in all of his glory and majesty, making a mark on his creation like never before. Oh, to be sure, in the first day of creation, we, we see the Shekinah glory of God. Before sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day, there is light. God reveals himself. And on the second day, he begins to order by separating the waters from the waters, on the third day, he orders the, the whole of the a whole of the creation, establishing the place where uh, life will one day team. Uh, God is showing us His attributes, His character. He's revealing us, uh, revealing to us Himself. But now, on the sixth day of creation. In this deliberative, consultative uh, language with the uh, uh, plural pronouns, God shows us something far more powerful. He says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Th- these terms are, are, are synonyms, oftentimes used interchangeably in the Old Testament, and yet the image and likeness actually carry slightly different nuances. It's not just repetition for emphasis. Here, the image is very, very concrete, while, while likeness is likely more abstract. So we have form and resemblance, shape and appearance. The point is, is that the creation of man shows us in the imago dei of of man something unique, something special, something glorious. Derek Kidner says, a man is unique and all of creation is set apart by his office, as we'll see in verses 26 and 28 and uh, places uh, like Psalm 8. And still more by his unique nature, which we'll see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 20, and a host of other places. But Kidner says, the crowning glory is man's relation to the Lord God. 
we see why almost immediately God intends man to exercise a kind of co-regency in the earth. He's given a, a blessing that is uh, uh, both authority and responsibility along with the attendant graces. But look at verse 27. After deliberation, after consultation, the, the triune God uh, creates man, imago dei, he creates the male and female. He creates a man in community, with unity and diversity, not like and unlike, intimate and distinct, equal but not identical. It's a remarkable revelation of the character and nature of God Himself. church in the fourth century faced enormous, enormous challenges. Escaping the fierce persecution of Diocletian at the beginning of the century, it was forced to endure schisms, schisms of Donatism in the West and Melitism in the East, but no challenge was greater than that of Arianism, which shook the whole church and for generations brought devastation to the life of the church in successive waves. But thankfully, God in His wisdom raised up a host of faithful apologists, not the least of which was Athanasius of Alexandria, who stood contra mundum, against the world, to stand for, to fight for biblical orthodoxy. R.C. has said that the concept of the Trinity has emerged as a touchstone of truth, a non-negotiable article of Christian orthodoxy. The fact that we can even say that, write that, is in large part because of the faithfulness of Athanasius. What's remarkable when you read Athanasius's arguments, though, is that uh, while he clearly understood that Arianism was a heresy about the Son, a diminishing of his uh, glory as a member of the pre-existent Godhead, self-sufficiency from before all time with the Father and the Spirit, Athanasius recognized that Arianism was equally an assault on the Father and on the Spirit. He takes Jesus' words quite literally, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. This is central to his anti-Arian argument. If the Arians deny the eternity of the Son, Peter Lightheart writes, then they should likewise deny that the Father is eternally Father, and the Spirit is eternally Spirit. Athanasius draws an ontological conclusion from the terminology of Scripture concerning the Father and the Son. He begins with this very passage in Genesis chapter 1, he argues that, that ultimately the great flowering of Trinitarian theology, which comes at the uh, baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, or, or the great Logos declaration in uh, John chapter 1, or, or the great I Am declarations in John chapter 8, or the intimacy displayed between Father and Son in the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17 find their genesis before all time, and the first inklings are revealed here in Genesis chapter 1. As God gives us the first phrases of His autobiography, He necessarily uses the agency of man's biography and therefore reveals who He is. Athanasius 
insisted that it is not possible to have a Christology without a patrology and a pneumatrology simultaneously. Lightheart writes, uh, the density of Athanasius's treatment of these themes is nicely captured by his paraphrase of Jesus' prayer in John 17. Jesus asks his father, in effect, whence is this their perfecting but that I, your word, having borne their body and become a man, have perfected work which you gave me before all time, O Father? And answers that the work is perfected because a man redeemed from sin no longer remain dead, but brought to life, have in each other by looking at me the bond of charity. The bond which we knew in glory before all time. C.S. Lewis Uh, discusses the doctrine of the Trinity in his uh, little book, Beyond Personality, which later became a part of his larger work, Mere Christianity. Uh, There he describes the eternal relationship between the Father and the Son. He says, we must think of the Son always, so to speak, streaming forth from the Father like light from a lamp or heat from a fire or thoughts from a mind. He is the self-expression of the Father, what the Father has to say. And there never was a time when he was not saying it. However, Lewis continues, the problem here, as with all human analogies, is that these pictures of light or heat are, are, are making it sound as if the Father and the Son were Uh, Two things instead of two persons, an intimate relationship with one another. Hence, we should always go back to that personal language of the Father and the Son that we find in the Bible. Uh, Naturally, God knows how to describe Himself much better than we know how to describe Him. He knows that the Father and the Son is more like the relation between uh, the first and second persons of the Trinity than anything else that we can think of. Much the most important thing to know is that it is a relationship, and a relationship of love. For the Father delights in His Son, and the Son yields to the will of His Father, and the Spirit illumines it and shines it forth throughout all of creation. This is, he says, what Christians mean by saying that God is love. Not that love is God, which is what some end up meaning by the phrase, but that the living, personal, dynamic relationship of love has been going on in God forever and and ultimately has created everything else, but most particularly has created God's own image and likeness, the Imago Dei, man. So this is the first major consequence of the doctrine of the Trinity for us. It gives us a way to say God really is love in a meaningful way. This transforms, Lewis says, our understanding of what God is like, and that, by the way, is perhaps the most important difference between Christianity and every other philosophy or religion, that in Christianity, God is not a static force, but a dynamic, pulsating relationship, a life, almost a kind of drama, almost a kind of community dance. Here, in Genesis chapter 1, we catch a glimpse of all of that, and what a tantalizing glimpse it is. We won't see it in full until 
Uh, we have the fullest revelation of Christ and the incarnation. No, we can only uh, pick up pieces as, as when wisdom calls forth the glory of creation in Proverbs chapter 8, or when we catch glimpses of, of the theophanic appearances in the, in the a narrative of the patriarchs. But surely, here at the very beginning, we have caught a glimpse of glory. A glory that will unfold marvelously, seamlessly from this all-sufficient God who needs nothing but in an expression of that mutual love brings forth all things. And then through His divine decrees unfolds redemption to the end of time. Here is the, is the picture of the living God from before all time. On the sixth day, man is fearfully, wondrously made. Not, not randomly by capricious gods and not, not as an accident of colliding molecules. Rather, we see the purposeful, intimate, uh, glorious revelation of a creative, loving God. And this reveals much about the character and nature of man, his calling, his, his purpose in carrying the Imago Dei in the midst of this a poor fallen world. But at the same time, it, it reveals much about the character and nature of God and His providential purposes. Here the autobiography of God begins with the biography of man, and it is glorious indeed. Again, in his uh, little booklet, uh, What is the Trinity?, the R.C. It says, one of the best ways of learning orthodoxy is by learning what is false. In fact, heresy historically has forced the church to be precise, to define its doctrines and differentiate truth from falsehood. At the beginning of time, with the creation of man, and all the glory of creation around him, we see the triune God revealed, which has Trinitarian implications for the whole of life. That is a sad thing that in so many ways we give lip service to the doctrine of Trinity but live as practical Arians, not seeing anything but the actions or perhaps the commands, the imperatives of the Lord God for our lives, but not seeing His revelation, the impress of His glory in and through all things, everywhere, at all times. This is why Thomas Chalmers in his astronomical discourses says, uh, that we should look at the fullness of creation and see Father, Son, and Spirit from before all time infiltrating uh, throughout uh, the history of the world and laying the groundwork for all eternity thereby changing everything that we do and everything that we are. May God be pleased to cause us to once again be struck, even by the glimmerings of the revelation of the triune God in the Old Testament. Long before the intimacy of the Father and Son is revealed as Jesus pours out His heart in the high priestly prayer in John 17, may we see in these glimmerings marching orders and a wondrous picture of the God of love 
from before all time. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, I thank you for this remarkable revealing. Now, I pray that you would, in this revealing, show us who we are and what we are to do. Show us, Lord God, in your marvels. Now, as you speak your autobiography, reveal to us the biography of man, the purpose of man, the calling and the place in this creation for which you have made us. We pray that we would, even in these glimmerings, catch a glimpse of the wonder of redemption and the purpose of all eternity. And we thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we ask this in your holy and blessed name. Amen.